Welcome to the third in and final lecture in this series by our distinguished visiting professor of human rights, opposing professor of human rights, Rodolfo Stavenhagen. Um, I wanted to just take a minute, less than a minute, to uh, preview some more activities that the Human Rights Program will be doing between now and the end of the quarter. I'm Susan Zesch, I'm Executive Director of the Human Rights Program. Before I introduce Professor Alan Collada, who will introduce Professor Stavenhagen. Um, uh, upcoming very soon on Friday, April 29th at 6 p.m., uh, former University of Chicago professor, now Columbia professor, Rashid Khalidi, will be giving a talk at International House on the uh, current political events in the Arab world. Um, professor Khalidi will, people have been stopping me in the supermarket and asking me when is he coming to town to explain the Middle East. He has quite a following from his 17 years at University of Chicago, and I think it'll be very interesting. So that's 6 p.m., April 29th. All day on April 30th, also at iHouse, the Human Rights Program is presenting a day-long conference on corporate social responsibility and human rights. Uh, the details are available on our website. Our postdoc, Charlotte Walker, organized it and has gotten great, con great participation from scholars and practitioners across the country. The keynote address will be by Peter Rosenblum, from Columbia University Law School. So all day, Saturday, April 30th. On May 17th, which I think is a Wednesday, um, Susie Linfield of NYU is coming to Chicago to talk about um, her, I guess one could call post santag critique of images and human rights and the representation of um, violence and human rights. And that'll be at the Frankie Institute at 5.30 p.m. on May 17th. And then back at International House on June 2nd, which is also a Thursday, we will present the annual Robert Kirshner Memorial Lecture. This is our end of the year wrap up um, by the Human Rights Program in honor of one of, and in memory of one of our founders, forensic pathologist Bob Kirshner. And at that um, event, we will provide some recognition. We're not allowed to hand out certificates to human rights minors in the college. We will announce the various prizes that are being given out by the Human Rights Program and invite you all to come for that for what will be, as we will have after this event tonight, a nice buffet. We believe in educating people and also feeding them, so you're uh, most welcome to all of our events. Uh, this evening we have the um, honor of having Professor Alan Collada, Department of Anthropology, um, introduce Professor Stavenhagen. Professor Collada has been at the University of Chicago since 1987. He has been chair of the Department of Anthropology, that big tribe over in the center of the uh, quadrangles. And he has also been twice, I think, director of the Center for Latin American Studies, a position he currently holds. His work has been divided in a very interesting basis, looking at a cross-cutting theme of indigenous rights and land rights, agricultural, ritual, and the interactions of humans and their environments, both in the highlands of Bolivia among the Aymara people, and also in rural Cambodia. Um, so I think that he is particularly apt as an introducer for Professor Stavenhagen's final lecture in this series. Thank you. Thanks. Well, uh, clearly the honor is really mine to be able to have this opportunity to introduce uh, our distinguished lecturer. And I'm sure many of you already know the biography of Professor Stavenhagen. You have uh, probably, some of you have come to this series of lectures, the Human Rights and Indigenous Peoples in the New Millennium. Uh, I unfortunately was unable to come to the first two lectures, and so I'm particularly pleased that I will be able to come to this lecture and to, and to learn about his experiences as a special rapporteur. Uh, to the United uh, Nations uh, for indigenous rights, uh, for rights and fundamental freedoms of indigenous uh, peoples. Um, I would say that uh, in my identity as uh, a former chair, thank goodness, uh, former chair of uh, the Department of Anthropology, I'm going to make a certain kind of a, a guess here. The, my guess is that some of you may know that uh, Professor Stavenhagen uh, has a degree from the University of Chicago and was here at a fundamental time the University of Chicago when anthropology was uh, a growing dynamic uh, and doing very different things than it does today in some senses. And one of, among the people here then, of course, uh, uh, and Professor Stavenhagen can correct me if I'm incorrect in my assumptions here or my projections, uh, but among the people here was, of course, uh, the very extraordinary uh, and famous uh, 
anthropologists uh, such as Robert Redfield and Saul Tax. And in particular, it's Saul Tax that I want to uh, mention here uh, because I think there may be some formative, either direct or indirect, uh, impact on Professor Stavaghagen's um, career uh, as an eminent uh, sociologist and also uh, a, a, a person engaged in issues of public uh, policy. I say that because uh, for so those who don't know the intellectual history of anthropology here at the university, uh, Saul Tax established a particular form of anthropological practice that he termed action anthropology, distinct from applied anthropology, but action anthropology, which attempted to reconcile the work of anthropologists with that of administrators, concerned with helping solve problems uh, identified by the people being studied. Uh, and in fact, here's a definition uh, of, from Saul Tax himself about what action anthropology was, uh, or maybe in fact is, or should be in the future. And here's his quote. By definition, action anthropology is an activity in which an anthropologist has two coordinate goals, to neither one of which he will delegate an inferior position. He wants to help a group of people to solve a problem, and he wants to learn something in the process. So equally, action anthropology is politically and socially engaged with the core principles of non-assimilation of indigenous people and of self-government. It is anthropology uh, freed as much as possible from its colonial origins. And it strikes me that's a kind of a description of Professor Stavenhagen's impact and career, both as a scholar and also as someone who's engaged deeply, clearly, in issues of indigenous rights. Uh, and I think there's something, uh, even if not influenced directly, perhaps Professor Stavenhagen can correct me on that, if not influenced directly, that was the atmosphere around this institution uh, in, in the era when Saul Tax was uh, um, a major, major force. Uh, and with that, uh, of course, I want to refer to uh, the theme, the topic uh, for this evening's uh, final lecture in the series. And of course, you already know the title of that is The Confessions of a Special Rapporteur, the, uh, the United Nations and the Search for Justice. Um, I, in order to kind of think about the introduction, and I'll be very brief because you want to hear Professor Stavenhagen and not, not me, I did go back and find out what was the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. This might be useful for you. So I have that summarized here, and I want to see how much that coincides with the actuality of someone who was, in fact, the Special Rapporteur from 2001 until 2008. And here is uh, the tripartite formula of what is the Special Rapporteur uh, in the United Nations uh, on uh, the uh, uh, rights of uh, indigenous uh, people. It is, first, to gather, request, receive, and exchange information from all relevant sources, including governments and indigenous people, and their communities and organizations on violations of their human rights and fundamental freedoms. Secondly, it is to formulate recommendations and proposals on measures and activities to prevent and remedy violations of the human rights of indigenous people, and third, to work closely with other special rapporteurs, special representatives, working groups, and other independent experts reporting uh, to the human rights bodies. So that is the mandate of the special rapporteur uh, uh, of the United Nations. And um, I, I also just want to make one final comment on this introduction, this sort of the University of Chicago atmosphere it also seems to be in the title. Uh, it strikes me it's very much the uh, confessions of a special rapporteur. It reminds me of, of course, the core and of, uh, of uh, St. Augustine, uh, perhaps, confessions. Uh, and it will be very interesting to hear from that mandate that I just described from the literature of the United Nations to the actuality of what it was like and what it is like to serve as the special rapporteur uh, to the United Nations. And with that, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Rodolfo Stavenhagen for the final lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> well, I think uh, for the third lecture of the series, I'll take the podium again rather than sitting there, if, uh, if uh, that's all right. Uh, thank you, Professor Kalala, for your introduction. Indeed, one of my fondest memories and most lasting memories of my stay so many decades ago as a student here of the college at the University of Chicago was the direct contact I had with both anthropologists whom you mentioned, Professor Robert Redfield, uh, whose class, one of his classes, uh, though they were graduate classes, he accepted me into because I came from Mexico, and uh, 
Professor Saltax, whom I continue to frequent many years later in many of his activities and saw when he used to come throughout Mexico, and who had been the leader of a research group in southeastern Mexico in Chiapas, uh, and among his students then were various of my professors later when I came back from Chicago and went on to graduate school, part of my confession, in, uh, in the School of Anthropology in Mexico. Some of my teachers had been with Soltax in southeast Mexico, and so this was being discussed all the time among ourselves, with our professors, among the students, and then later at the beginning of our professional work, the concept of action anthropology, of course, which you mentioned, was widely discussed in Mexico where the older or the different concept, or not so different after all, of applied anthropology was used uh, by Mexican policymakers and anthropologists who also went into indigenismo and the public policy aspect. So uh, for all these years and decades, the relationship with uh, professors uh, Redfield and, uh, and Tax here at the University of Chicago continued to be a point of reference, uh, certainly in my, own, in my own career. So I'm very glad to make that link again with the uh, Department of Anthropology at this time. Well, uh, as you introduced me as the uh, special rapporteur, and my uh, talk today is entitled, indeed, uh, The Confessions of a Special Rapporteur, let me just uh, say what this is all about. And I could begin by saying that uh, in those years since the mandate, since I became uh, was appointed Special Rapporteur by the UN in the year 2001, it's, it'll be 10 years now, um, I've encountered lots of people who always ask, well, what is all this about? What, what do you actually do? What good is it? And so forth. So I will, I will begin with a, with a frequently asked uh, questions, uh, FAQ, Introduction to the Special Rapporteur. Uh, some of the, 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 the questions that I remember, which I have had to deal with in interviews and uh, talking to, to friends and people and colleagues and students and so forth, is how did you get there? That's the first question. And second, was it a full-time job or did you just do it on the side? Uh, thirdly, more difficult, what exactly do special rapporteurs do if they do anything? Uh, fourth, what happens to your reports? Uh, what's the implementation? Uh, how do you follow up or who follows up on what you have to say? Uh, fifth, how does your work help indigenous peoples, if at all? Uh, six, what did you find most frustrating? And what did you find most satisfying in this activity? Seventh, and I could go on and on, but I'll stop with that one. Has anything changed for indigenous peoples thanks to your work as a special rapporteur? So let me try to answer some of these frequently asked questions, and which I pose myself very often when I look back at those very exciting years in which I, I think I did a full job because I thought at the beginning that it would take about well, maybe 20 or 30 percent of my time, but I found out very soon that to do this job even halfway satisfactorily, it would take up 150 percent of my time, and that's what it did uh, for a full uh, seven years, and in the ensuing years since, since I, I left the job formally. So let me give you some backgrounds. In my talk last, uh, last week, I mentioned how from that earlier situation of indigenous peoples around the world and the colonial and the post-colonial situation and the emergence of the national state and its uh, really ignoring indigenous peoples and the concept of building modern states, where did the indigenous peoples fit? Well, they didn't fit at all, and that's part of the problem. And as a result, we have a long history of uh, the emergence of indigenous peoples as organized actors, as social movements, 
as uh, litigants and uh, plaintiffs in the courts and as uh, political, uh, politically aware peoples who come to international organizations to ask for redress for all these uh, uh, situations in which they have been the victims. And that's where the United Nations comes in. And that is where eventually indigenous peoples got to the United Nations uh, through a series of processes which uh, have been detailed and have been described by a number of scholars uh, and which starts, well, there are uh, antecedents before that, but formally it starts somewhere around the middle of last century in one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations, namely the International Labour Organization, the ILO, which for a number of reasons by the middle 50s had uh, become interested in the indigenous peoples of the Andean Cordillera in South America. And by agreement with a number of local Andean governments, the ILO uh, set up a program to help native peoples, indigenous peoples in these countries improve their situations. And in order to do that, it called upon no less than anthropologists. And it created, uh, the ILO did at that time, I think it was the year 1956 or 57, it created something called the Andean Mission. La Misión Andina, or El Programa Andino, the Andean Program. After signing uh, treaties or signing agreements between the ILO and the various countries involved, uh, the Andean countries, particularly Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia, a group of anthropologists, of educators and others went down into these countries and stayed for a long while, several years. These programs lasted, not always the same people, but ILO support, in order to develop mechanisms, procedures, theories, ideas, programs, plans for the improvement of the situation of the working peasantry, because ILO is a labor organization, indigenous peasantry of highland South America. And this became the Andean program. As a result of these concerns, which uh, had been discussed in the ILO for several years, the ILO finally adopted a treaty, a convention, known as the Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples in Independent Countries. Why independent countries? Because at that time, the concept of indigenous peoples or natives was related to the colonial system. And it was in the colonies that natives had problems with the countries, the states, the dominant groups for which they had to work and under whose domination they found themselves as a result of the colonial situation. But then it turned out that uh, even if col colonialism was disappearing and countries were becoming independent, beginning in the 1950s, continuing during the 1960s, indigenous peoples were still around. And not only that, but indigenous <coughs> peoples were around in countries that had become independent many decades earlier, namely the South American countries that had already shaken off the chains of colonial uh, domination, but in which indigenous peoples maintained a similar status, a similar situation than the one they had, uh, as the one they had previously. So the ILO was concerned with what happened to indigenous peoples after formally having been declared equal citizens in many of these countries, but particularly in this case, in the Latin American countries. And they came up with Convention 157. Convention 157, no, excuse me, Convention 107, uh, which was adopted in 1957, sometimes I make a mistake there, everybody does. Uh, Convention 107 adopted certain of the guidelines which were very um, widely 
followed by governments in different parts of the world, namely the paternalistic, the top-down approach, the idea that indigenous peoples needed to assimilate, to become incorporated into national society, into mainstream society, in order to improve their standards of living. And uh, Convention 107 was designed to set an international standard which countries should follow and therefore improve their relationship with indigenous peoples. By the 1980s, which was about 25 years later after this treaty had been adopted, things had already changed. And the indigenista policies of the Latin American countries were being criticized increasingly by indigenous peoples themselves, by outside observers, and also by those very self-same anthropologists who had received some of their training here at the University of Chicago decades earlier and who began questioning the major principles of these indigenous policies of these countries. And so a movement started in the ILO in those years saying, let's review Convention 107, let's achieve an aggiornamento, put it up to date, make it more realistic, make it more to the liking of indigenous peoples, and a couple or a small group of indigenous representatives and other so-called experts were invited by the ILO to discuss some of these issues and uh, it was my good fortune to uh, be part of this one expert group that uh, met for a while in the middle 80s and which came up with a, a draft uh, of a renewed Convention 107. The problem was that there were very few indigenous peoples involved. Why was that so? Because indigenous peoples as such are not members of any international organization, of any interstate organization. So the only indigenous peoples or persons who were invited to this expert meeting and then other commissions and finally to the general conference of the ILO, which in the year 1989, uh, well, more than 30 years after the first convention, uh, came up with the next convention, or the revision of Convention 107, which is Convention 169 of the ILO, which is named exactly alike, Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples in Independent Countries, but instead of being named 107, it's now named 169. And indigenous peoples were only able to take part in these discussions because some of the delegations, government delegations or workers' delegations or employers' delegations, because you may remember that the ILO is a tripartite organization. It's not only made up of government representatives, it's made up of governments, employers' organizations and labor unions or workers' organizations. And that gives it a certain amount of balance but it is not made up of indigenous peoples. So only if indigenous persons had been invited to be a part of one of these delegations, usually the workers' delegations from the different countries, sometimes on government delegations as well, and once or twice uh, being among the employers' delegations. So a few indigenous peoples were around and signed these documents and promoted Convention 169. In Convention 169, is different in many points uh, to Convention 107. It brings certain issues up to date. It is written in a more human rights perspective than was Convention 107. It is less patriarchal. It is less uh, from the top down, less patronizing uh, than uh, Convention 107. And indigenous peoples around the world were quite happy with it in 1989. It began to be ratified by 1990 by a small number of states. It is still an international convention that has not been ratified by a large number of states. Because so many states say, well, it doesn't concern us because we don't have indigenous peoples. Or they didn't like that it had certain points that went far beyond the earlier convention. 
but still having been ratified to date by about 20 states, which is not very much in a world of international organizations made up of about 200 member states in, in every case, still the adoption of Convention 169 was a turning point for the presence of indigenous peoples in the United Nations. At the same time, or parallel to that, beginning in the 1960s, the Commission of Human Rights of the United Nations began to uh, make some reports on the issue of racism and discrimination around the world, but particularly focusing on the apartheid regime in South Africa, which became a major concern for the United Nations politically, as we all know, and became uh, of concern to the various uh, specialized agencies, such as the ILO, such as UNESCO, and, and others. But in one of the reports that was presented in the early 70s to the United Nations on racism, one of the last paragraphs there said, we also recommend that studies be carried out about the situation in the world of indigenous peoples. Because here in this first report, we haven't really dealt with indigenous peoples, but we find that their situation is very similar to other racially defined and oppressed and discriminated against minorities as those that we have been dealing with in this particular report. That report is from the early 1970s. So this uh, uh, paragraph, which was drafted for this report on racism, listen well to this, which was drafted by a young lawyer from Guatemala who had seen an ad while he was a student here in the US, who had seen an ad in a paper saying, we would like uh, to employ some young lawyers interested in human rights issue, contact the UN office in New York. So this young lawyer by the name of Augusto Williamson Diaz from Guatemala contacted the office in the UN and they said, great, you're just the kind of person we need for this. And particularly because you speak Spanish as well as English, welcome because we, we have very few Spanish speakers here on the staff in the United Nations. And they gave him a job. And eventually, when the Office of, for Human Rights was created in the UN a few years later, he applied for that, being already in the UN system. And uh, he was employed in Geneva, where he then uh, lasted for 30 years before his retirement and his return to Guatemala. But what, he did, what did he do in Geneva? He was an aide to the people who drafted these reports on racism. And whenever he could, he put in a little something for indigenous peoples. And when they asked him, why, why, why do you insist on that? He said, look, because I come from a country where indigenous peoples are the majority of the population and where they are the poorest, the most discriminated, the most rejected people, the victims of everyday racism. So if the United Nations is serious about human rights and is serious about the struggle against discrimination and the struggle against, uh, uh, against racism, then I suggest that it also include uh, indigenous peoples. And so that went all the way up the Commission of Human Rights and the General Secretary and then down again to the local bodies and so forth. And everybody said, well, indeed, yes, we hadn't thought about that. That's quite useful, that's quite interesting. And they didn't find anything wrong with dealing with the human rights of indigenous peoples, particularly when it came from somebody from an independent country. You know, this wasn't somebody in, in one of the remaining colonies where, of course, native labor was also uh, always a question for these uh, uh, organizations. But so they said, yes, move ahead on that. And then. Augusto Willemsen, from inside the offices of the human rights groups, a very small group and uh, not very powerful in the UN structure. It never was, it never is, it never will be, but they sometimes come out with, with some interesting ideas. And so Augusto Willemsen Diaz, he uh, established contact with some of the NGOs that were present and still are, of course, uh, at the UN in Geneva and said, why don't we organize a couple of meetings? And so, a few years later, at the end of the 70s, uh, 
a couple of very important NGO organized meetings on the problems of the human rights of indigenous peoples and particularly on the land issues as human uh, rights questions that is the land issues concerned uh, with indigenous peoples were being discussed and indigenous experts because of course there even then there existed already indigenous experts were asked to come to these meetings and to present their point of view together with some government representatives and finally to make a long story uh, short uh, this led to a resolution in the Human Rights Commission asking for the Commission to make a study, an extensive study of the situation of indigenous peoples around the world. And again, Mr. Augusto Williamson Diaz really was the man who in the office of the General Secretary of the UN got the study going, which is known, came out about several years later, which is known as the Martinez Cobo report. Martinez Cobo was then the special rapporteur of the subcommission on the prevention of discrimination and the protection of minorities, which in itself was a subordinate organism to the Human Rights Commission of the UN. And this gentleman, Martinez Cobo from Ecuador, uh, was named the special rapporteur, and he took Mr. Williamson Diaz as his assistant. And Williamson Diaz worked for many, many years and prepared these reports for Martinez Cobo. And Martinez Cobo presented them on a yearly basis to the Human Rights Commission. But Martinez Cobo has said very publicly, and I think it's important because one has to give, uh, well, the dues when, it, when they're due, uh, he always said, well, I didn't really write this report. It was Augusto Williamson Diaz who did all the footwork and did all the research and did all the original writing. And I've asked Williamson Diaz several times, is that true that you did it all? He said, of course it's true. <laughs> I did all the work and so I always go around the world and when asked for one of these questions, you know, uh, what's your interest in this? I say, well, one of the interests is to explain, in fact, who does the work at the United Nations. <laughs> Uh, because this not, doesn't only happen, it's not the diplomats, or very rarely is it the diplomats themselves who present their names to these reports, you know, who are the authors of these reports. But it's the people who are in the organization and who are interested in doing this and who are committed to doing it and come out with the report. Why was this report important, this particular report, which came out in the UN in the 1980s and uh, the, finally only the last chapter of an extensive report was published by the UN I think in a 1986, 85 or 86 on the situation of indigenous peoples around the world based on extensive research available at the time no internet, no databases, no googling yet available simply just you know writing to people around the world saying can you recommend uh, something that I should read in order to learn about what's happening to indigenous peoples around the world. And that took a long time. But he sent out questionnaires, he received the questionnaires back again, then he put them all together, he read extensively in the books of anthropologists, including the Chicago School and a number of others, and came out with the martinez Cobo report. And for the first time, for the first time in the UN, there was a definition of indigenous peoples. And there was a description, however briefly and superficial, of the human rights situation ailing indigenous peoples. And this definition has made its way around the world several times. It is now included in all of the major international human rights instruments, whether they are of the UN, of UNESCO, of the specialized agencies, or including the constitutional reforms that in recent years have been taken up by several governments, uh, the, the Bolivian reform, for example, and a number of others, which are basing their own view of indigenous peoples uh, on this definition in the Martinez Cobo report written by Augusto Williamson Diaz. And from there, that definition has now become part of these instruments, such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, such as any number of other formal UN 
uh, documents. How did all this come about? Well, it came about because one or two people, and then four or five, and then 15 or 20, and then 30 and 50, etc., etc., came together in the interstices of the interstitial spaces of the very complex United Nations structure and brought it to the attention first of the Commission of Human Rights, which is an intergovernmental body, which is the first level, and then to the um, Third Committee of the General Assembly to the Economic and Social Council of the, of the United Nations and finally to the General Assembly to make it become a major decision of the United Nations through voting at the, uh, at the General Assembly. And that's how indigenous issues came in. But there were other areas as well. Because of this increasing concern, uh, the Commission of Human Rights also approved a suggestion that came firstly from the pen of Augusto Williamson Diaz and then went up through the, the rapporteur and then to the others and the others, which was the creation of a working group on indigenous people. A small working group of five people, uh, members of the subcommission uh, for the prevention of uh, discrimination and the protection of minorities, which has now changed its name. It's now called the, the Subcommission for the uh, Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, uh, a few years later. But this subcommission took up the idea and went all the way up to the Economic and Social Council one again, once again and asked for permission to create a working group on indigenous peoples. So within the subcommission in the early 80s, a small working group of indigenous peoples was established. Why do I say small? Because it only was made up of five members of this subcommission, of independent experts of the subcommission, one for each major region of the world. But why did it become so important? Because for the first time, at least as anybody can remember, in UN history, the uh, first chairman of the working group, again assisted by Augusto Willemsen Diaz, a lawyer from Norway, and uh, Asbjörn Eide, teacher of the University of Norway, founder of the Norway Human Rights Institution. And in Norway, just before this happened at the UN, they had an uprising and a movement by the Sami people of northern Norway protesting against the building of a dam in the Alta region up in Sápmi. And so this gentleman, Asbjörn Naide, had been involved in that, uh, in protecting the Sámi people and helping them bring their case to the Norwegian government in the far south of the country. And he was a specialist, had become a member of the subcommission of, uh, of uh, the, the one I just mentioned, and was named the first chairman of this working group. And he and Augusto Williams and Diaz then said, how can we discuss the issues of indigenous peoples here if there are no indigenous peoples around? So they come up with the idea saying, well, let's open our wor working group. Let's invite indigenous peoples from around the world to come and bring their case to the United Nations. Well, not every government was enthusiastic about this. Not even the secretariat of the UN itself was enthusiastic about it. But these people pushed and pushed and pushed, and finally the subcommission agreed, OK, why don't you open up and invite uh, people to come to the working group? I was at some of the early meetings of the working group, and there were some, the five people who are members of the group. Then there were some observers from member states, because they're representatives at the UN. They were considered to be observers, not members, in fact, of the working group, but they would come to this meeting, maybe half a dozen. And about half a dozen indigenous persons. That was all. Back in 1982, the working group came together for fully more than 20 years. And at one of its last meetings in the uh, early parts of this uh, millennium, of this century, there were up to 1,500 1,500, 1,500 registered participants as NGOs, 
representatives of NGOs, but indigenous peoples, representing indigenous persons from all over the world who were accepted as formal participants of the working group. And what did this working group do during all these 20 years? All sorts of things. One of the things was that in its yearly meetings, it just had to sit and listen to what indigenous peoples wanted to say. And indigenous persons received the right to speak two or three or four minutes, maybe not more, but they spoke before the world. They spoke at the UN. And this has now become part of the world discourse. And this is the way they got the issues of indigenous peoples into the UN. And what this working group in the end came up with, basically, is the first draft of the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And much of that draft was inspired, and that's why I raised it at the beginning, by Convention 169 of the ILO, which had also been discussed in the middle 80s and which was adopted, I repeat, back in 1989. But the Commission, the Human Rights Commission, came up with the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by the year 2006, when it had already changed its name to Human Rights Council in the UN, it adopted the declaration which had been presented by the working group with participation of indigenous peoples. I am saying in a nutshell what took over 20 years of negotiations, over 20 years of ups and downs, over 20 years of satisfactions and disappointments, but Part, uh, particularly, it was a, a generation of struggle for indigenous peoples who came to the UN, who were able to set out their case, who were listened to by the sympathetic ears of members of the Secretariat, and also with the support of a number of governments, but not all governments. There was a lot of struggle and still is in the UN today between different governments, uh, in fact, uh, uh, due to different perspectives, ideologies, and so forth, and some governments who didn't care much about indigenous rights, and others who supported this work. And therefore, finally, we come to the end of the decade, of the last decade, where we have a uh, declaration on human rights. Now, where does a special rapporteur fit in there? That was a, a third perspective that came along. First, the ILO, then the UN Human Rights Commission and Council with work on the declaration and the various reports that came into it, an increasing organization of indigenous peoples at the international level. The mechanism, what they call in the UN the special mechanisms of the human rights sector, of the Human Rights Commission and now the Human Rights Council, as it is called, arises because the Human Rights Council has to deal with any number of very serious human rights violations around the world, has to deal with any number of human rights issues which are raised around the world or raised by governments or simply known uh, in the world because uh, they happen. And the Commission as an intergovernmental body is made up of diplomats, of government representatives. And back in the 1970s, this started, when there were these army coups in some countries, particularly in Latin America, and particularly in the case of Chile, where the Pinochet dictatorship was very soon pointed at by everybody in the world as being a major human rights <coughs> violator of its own populations. And somebody brought this to the United Nations, to the Human Rights Commission, saying the, committee, the Commission has to get involved in these human rights uh, uh, violations done by these military dictatorships in Latin America and elsewhere in the world. And uh, then the Human Rights Commission said, well, we don't have the mechanism to do that. We only meet once a, once a year for a few weeks. We have to deal with all these issues. So what shall we do? How do we get informed? So somebody came up with the idea, well, there have already been some rapporteurs who do studies for the UN on particular issues, why don't we set up a mechanism for gathering information which will come to our attention every year on particular issues that we are interested in? And one of the first rapporteurs that the Human Rights Commission set up 
was the one on the situation in Chile. Then many more came later, and it soon divided into two kinds of expert mechanisms, as this is called. I was very surprised the first time I arrived as a special rapporteur in the UN, being called by everybody a special mechanism. I never thought of myself <laughs> as a special mechanism, but uh, apparently it worked out. I mean, I, I did do some exercises to, in order to become <laughs> a, spe a special mechanism. But anyway, it, it, it developed into two parts. One section was special rapporteurs or mandates dealing with country issues. So there was a special rapporteur on Chile, and then there was one on, on the Congo, and there was one on, on Cambodia, and, and all sorts. And now during the Balkan Wars, uh, Yugoslavia, and there are, I don't know, about 30 different uh, countries that, uh, that had received, well, the mandate was established by the Human Rights Commission. The countries involved weren't usually very happy to be the object of, a, of an investigation by the UN. But the second uh, perspective was thematic rapporteurs on thematic issues and that's where indigenous rights came in because there were our rapporteurs against discrimination rapporteurs on the freedom of uh, of religion rapporteurs on the rights of children rapporteurs on the rights of migrants rapporteurs on the rights of, of forced uh, you know for on forced disappearances and so for a long time when all of this uh, was taking place which I mentioned a while ago um, indigenous peoples had come to the UN and said, we want a special rapporteur for indigenous rights. Not only draft a declaration, that's fine, not only apply Convention 169, that's also what we want, uh, but we want a special rapporteur to report regularly to the United Nations on the situation of the human rights of indigenous peoples. And this was discussed in the Commission you know, for several years, back and forth between the working group and the subcommission and then the commission and then the, uh, the economic and social council and then it was sent back again to the subcommission and they uh, discussed it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then there was a world conference on human rights where there was a strong representation of indigenous peoples for the first time at a worldwide world conference on human rights. This took place in 1992. <laughs> In Vienna, it's known as the Vienna Conference on Human Rights. And there, the indigenous representatives were able to convince a number of government delegations to make a proposition that a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples be actually appointed by the UN. This was in 1992, the first formal statement that the system might have a special rapporteur on indigenous rights. And the Vienna Conference was very important because slowly many of these world conferences, just as the Environmental Conference in Rio de Janeiro and, and others, uh, devoted one or two paragraphs of their final declaration on indigenous peoples, which had never occurred before, but which was a result of these 20 years of lobbying inside of the system and outside of the system. And slowly the language of let's do something about indigenous peoples, let's respect the rights of indigenous peoples, let's get indigenous peoples involved in our questions on the environment, in our questions of climate change, in our questions of development strategies, in our questions of the uh, fighting against poverty, of improving education. I mean, you have all the set of these issues that the United Nations gets involved in. So slowly, the idea of indigenous rights came in. And at Vienna, something interesting happened because the draft that came out from a drafting committee uh, said something about uh, concern with indigenous people around the world. Mind you, indigenous people. And when they were presenting that for the final approval, there was a great hissing sound coming up from, the, uh, from all of the people there. S, 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 we want the S. What did they want? They wanted the word people to be changed to peoples because of the conceptual, theoretical, and public policy, and of course, human rights implications of whether the word is indigenous people or the word is indigenous peoples.
And since then, it has been indigenous peoples. But when finally the creation of the mandate of the special rapporteur came to a vote at the uh, Economic and Social Council, creating the mandate back in the year 2000, the name was, you read it, professor, people without an S. Because in the UN system, nobody wanted to use the word peoples if it wasn't really uh, absolutely necessary. Why didn't they want to use the word peoples? Because in the UN system, there is a hallowed right of peoples to self-determination, which was adopted way back by the General Assembly in 1966, and which is Article 1 of both international covenants on human rights. The international covenant on civil and political rights and the international covenant on economic, social, cultural rights. Both have the same Article 1 saying all peoples have the right to self-determination. And so here, several years later, indigenous organizations come to the UN and start arguing, saying we are peoples. Our rights have been violated by you guys, the big powers and the small powers and the colonial systems. You have taken our sovereignty, you have taken our lands, you have taken our cultures, you have uh, enslaved us, you have uh, taken our humanity. We want our rights not only as equal citizens, we want our rights as peoples, S at the end, to be recognized by the United Nations. But yet, when the suggestion came to the uh, Human Rights Council, it was then called still the Human Rights Commission, the mandate was named because certain governments did not want to use peoples, uh, the concept peoples, as applied to indigenous persons. And so the mandate was a special rapporteur on the human rights of indigenous people. That was uh, what finally was the mandate that I... I um, I uh, was given by the United Nations. But and in that group, the GRULAC, two governments, Guatemala and Mexico, initiated a, a, a vote-getting exercise, signatures, saying we want the mandate of the special rapporteur to be created. And they convinced the other Latin American <coughs> groups, and then the Latin American group lobbied with other groups, and you know how the lobbying is. You support us on this one, we'll support you on your thing, you know, the, the horse trading that goes on daily, on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis in the United Nations, just as it does in the US Congress and elsewhere. Uh, and so finally, the mandate was established as read out a minute ago, or few, well, more than a minute ago, a few minutes ago, by Professor Collada. And uh, once the mandate was established, then of course the second stage was, well, who will be named to the mandate? And again, there was a lot of lobbying going on. And again, then the, the other country said, well, you guys in the Latin American group who are responsible for this mandate in the first place and did a good job by getting all these votes together and so forth, why don't you propose some people uh, to, to, uh, to occupy this mandate? We want to appoint the first special rapporteur because the mandate was the first time the UN really dealt with indigenous, indigenous rights. As a, as a subject of direct uh, engagement. And uh, so that came about, and uh, personally, and that's where w one of my uh, St. Augustine's confessions come in, I received a phone call uh, when I was visiting professor at Harvard University, this was just about 10 years ago, uh, by somebody from the Mexican Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs. And they said, hey, Rodolfo, did you hear that this mandate was created? So I said, yes, I read about it in the papers. Well, uh, you know, we want to propose somebody. I said, yes, who, who are you going to propose? Uh, thinking I, they were asking me to support somebody's. And they said, well, we wanted to propose you. Are you available? And I, I was a bit flabbergasted. But in those things, you either take, you know, catch the ball as it comes along or nothing happens. And because of earlier involvement for years in at the government level, at the international level, at the academic level, at the NGO level, in Mexico and elsewhere, I had certain contact with uh, 
issues of indigenous people's rights, and I said, yeah, why don't you propose me? I'll, I'll play the game, I'll go along. And so then the other lobbying started, you know. They began lobbying the Mexican government with the Guatemalan government and the other governments in Rulak, and uh, then with the, other, uh, uh, with the other delegations in the Human Rights Commission. And so a couple of months passed, and then I, I get a phone call from the then created office uh, of the High Commissioner, uh, of the High Commissioner of, uh, for Human Rights, saying, well, at its, uh, at its meeting yesterday, the Human Rights uh, Commission decided to appoint you as Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Rights. That was in, in the spring of 2001, exactly 10 years ago. And so suddenly my life changed. I suddenly became, well, uh, the mandate, the special mechanism for, for in, indigenous rights. As uh, our professor told us a while ago, the mandate is, is very clear. Uh, you have to do research, uh, you have to study, you have to communicate with governments, with indigenous peoples, with international organizations. You have to make recommendations on human rights issues of indigenous peoples. And finally, you have to prepare a report to the Commission of Human Rights on a yearly basis, which then goes up the ladder, ends up in the special, uh, in, the, in, the, in the General Assembly of the, of the UN. And uh, at first, I, I was very surprised. I didn't know much about the UN, though I, I had worked well with the ILO group that had done the, the Convention 169 draft. I had been for a few years a, an official in UNESCO but always at other levels. Now this time, it turned out that being a special rapporteur is a pastime, because you don't become an official of the United Nations. You don't get paid in the first place. You don't get an official status at the United Nations. Uh, by the way, just today I got my ID here at the University of Chicago. I'm very proud of that. Uh, but I never got the ID as an official of the UN, because special rapporteur is something uh, quite individual. But the good thing about being a special rapporteur is that you're not in the employ of any government. And in fact, if you're a government official, you can't become a special rapporteur of anything. Why? Because a special rapporteur has to be an independent expert. The emphasis is more on the independent than on the expert word. But it doesn't always happen that way. Now, sometimes you get people who are there who are not that independent, as we would all hope, and who may not be that expert as well, but because they're the result of this political lobbying and give and take and horse trading among the governments, uh, then, you know, it doesn't always work that. In my case, I was happy to say that I did feel independent. I didn't feel particularly expert in view of all these experts that I did uh, find there, and in particularly in view of indigenous peoples who are the real experts regarding their, their own rights. But more or less, this is the way I, I presented myself at, at the UN. And when they said, well, um, how much time can you spend on it? Uh, well, being a, 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 a full-time professor at El Colegio de Mexico, I said, well, maybe 30% of my time. I was an optimist. It turned out to be much more, and I had to drop just about everything else in order to uh, deal with that particular mandate. But my university has always been very supportive uh, for that work, and I know that my, uh, my, uh, the, the, the successor, who is now the Special Rapporteur Professor at the University of Arizona, he not only gets full support from his university, but they even set up a special program at the University of Arizona to support the work of their Special Rapporteur. So things are improving, and improving for indigenous peoples, and improving in, within the United Nations um, system. The only ones at that first meeting I attended of the working group who were not happy, who were not happy with my appointment, were the representatives of indigenous peoples. Because many of them, having done all that work, all that lobbying, they felt that once the mandate had been created, the special rapporteur should be an indigenous person, himself or herself. And I couldn't and I can't not agree with that. In fact, yes, it should have been an indigenous person. 
an independent indigenous person, an ind indigenous person with experience, with expertise, but it wasn't, again, because of the political uh, lobbying. But um, I think over the years I was able to convince indigenous organizations around the world that they did have a friend in me as special rapporteur and that I was doing my best in supporting the cause of human rights of indigenous peoples. And when I was asked several times, well, what do you intend to do? How are you going to work? They immediately thought that the next day I would have a full program, you know, with all everything detailed and so forth, uh, which I didn't because I had only been informed a few weeks before about, uh, about this appointment. Uh, and uh, my answer was always, well, I'll do my best to help indigenous peoples in their struggle for human rights, even if it means stepping on some toes. For example, governmental toes, those are big toes, big shoes, but also other toes that may be more sensitive to some issues. And I think in the end it worked out, but it's for others to judge. But that was the, the, the way I, I got into the system. Now, during the seven years that I was there, during the seven years, um, I officially visited, and I won't go into the details, what is an official mission, what is not an official mission. It's, it, it all becomes very rapidly very bureaucratic. And the moment it becomes bureaucratic, you lose every time the bureaucrats win a battle, you know, you lose a little bit of your independence. But that's the same thing in national governments. I suppose it's the same thing in uh, college administrations. Uh, it certainly is in my own institution. In, in Mexico, but in those years I visited officially 11 countries and there are 11 country reports out uh, which are available online. It, it's, it's all very public, it's, uh, all this is, is known. Uh, and then I visited about 10 more countries on more unofficial ways, say, attending a, 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 an academic meeting or getting an invitation from an indigenous organization, come and visit us for three weeks, we'll take you all around the country, and that sort of thing. And then without asking for the government's permission, you know, you happen to be in the country. The difference is that on an official mission, you have to receive an invitation by the government. When the government invites you to come in and visit the country, then it's an official mission. And then you can say so in, in your report, uh, that, and the reports are official reports and they get circulated in the UN system. If it's an unofficial mission, like attending uh, seminars or uh, saying yes to an invitation handed out by an indigenous uh, organization or a group of indigenous organizations, which I did several times along the way, then the limitation is that you cannot write a report on that particular mission or visit for the UN because it won't be dealt with as an official document and then nobody finds out about it. But there are ways to get around these things and rapporteurs are very um, skilled in doing that. For example, they can say, by the way, on this particular subject, I have received some very important communications from, and then they put all of that into the, into the report. Uh, but they don't say, I was in that country on an official mission because then it would get out of the report. But e even then, when you do it the first way, uh, governments may, may not like it and say, how come you, you know all that information? Uh, and this has happened to me several times uh, during those years when certain government delegates actually asked for the UN, uh, the Secretariat, to withdraw a certain report on a certain country because they were not happy with it. But that is never done in the UN, at least not yet, at least not in my time, when governments can actually uh, block the circulation of a report because they don't like what is being said in the report. And there have been many cases, not only with regarding to indigenous peoples, but many other cases where uh, the activity uh, of the special rapporteur has gotten into a lot of trouble with particular governments. So this happens all the time. And the first, at first when I got these communications saying, they want to cut my report, what do I do? I was told nothing. They can't do it. Legally, it's not possible for a government to stop the distribution of your report because this is a United Nations report and you are an independent expert, so you can say whatever you want within bounds, of course, there are limitations. And there are such limitations that when I left, the Human Rights Council adopted, not because of me, of course, 
but the Human Rights uh, uh, Council adopted a code of ethics for special mechanisms. You know, they didn't say for Rodolfo Stavenhagen and so and so and so. They said for special mechanisms, there has to be a code of ethics because some countries simply don't like outsiders to come and look at their human rights record, particularly regarding indigenous peoples. But you get to live with that. And next to that, there are, of course, very wonderful experiences, like being greeted up in the mountains of the Philippines after a harrowing drive up the mountainside uh, on a bad road by a, a sign saying, welcome human rights. You know, that, that's very humbling when you see it the first time because there are a lot of expectations about what, uh, what you can do and what you cannot do. And wonderful meetings all around the world with indigenous peoples in their communities, in special sessions that were organized where people from hundreds of miles around would come and sit down for a few hours with a special rapporteur. Or somewhere in the Mao forest in Kenya with the Ogiek people when they said, uh, you know, we have a president of ours in the United Nations. I said, yes, yes, he's from Africa, uh, Kofi Annan. Well, you tell our president to do this and that. We count on you to go and tell the president uh, what our situation is here in Kenya. And that kind of uh, give and take uh, has taken place all, all over the world. And uh, in the case of Kenya, uh, I, I got a degree. I must mention that because it's uh, like the college degree I received here in Chicago so many year, years ago. They named me an honorary elder. And they put a cape on me made of the furs of little animals of the forest. I still carry it. I don't dress in it very often, but <laughs> I, I carry it around because it's a sign of distinction. And they told me, look, by being named an elder of our tribe, you now undertake the responsibility of helping us and supporting us whenever we need your help. And uh, there it was. Uh, every now and then I get an indirect uh, message from the Ogik tribe, but it has never required any particular effort on my part to help them around. And I haven't been back, unfortunately. I know that if I go back, they'll probably pull out a list of things. What have you done? Let us know uh, whether you uh, d still deserve to be named an honorary, be considered an honorary elder of our tribe. And so there were a number of of, uh, oh, let me tell you another story. I was in Guatemala. At the end of the mission, this was one of my first missions, at the end of the mission, there was a, uh, a meeting with the whole cabinet and the vice president of the country. The president couldn't make it because he was elsewhere. He was out of the country, otherwise it would have been with the president. It was with the vice president of the country and I was supposed to give them a sort of debriefing of what I had done, what I had seen, what the major issues were. This happens in most countries, uh, where at the end of, a, of, of the mission, the, the, the rapporteur has to report, obviously, before writing his report. And the interesting thing in Guatemala was what I know, this is, the moment I came in and talked to other people, everybody told me, you know what, this was right after, a few years after, uh, there has, they had signed a peace agreement after 30 years of civil war, a peace agreement between the guerrillas and the government. And one of the major documents of the peace agreement was the, the right to culture of indigenous peoples, the right to peace and culture of indigenous peoples. So this was something I had to look at. But whenever I, I talk to people, beginning with the UN representative in the country, then the diplomatic community, basically of the uh, Western European community, uh, and then with some legislators and with some academics and certainly with indigenous peoples themselves, the message I got all the time was, you know, nothing gets done in this country because there is no political will. And so one, they said it once, twice, and I hadn't expected to hear that, but when so many people tell you there is no political will in this country, so therefore all these rights continue to be violated and abused, what can you do? So, when I came to this meeting at the end of my mission, uh, this full cabinet meeting, all the ministers were there, including the Minister of Defense and the Finance Minister and the Minister of Labor and Agriculture and Education and the Vice President himself who was chairing the meeting. At the end of my presentation, which wasn't particularly, uh, I think, kind to the efforts of the government at the time, so I got some glacial uh, 
views and stares, particularly from the Minister of, of, of Defense, which I wasn't very happy about. But uh, there was a sort of silence, and then I, I turned to the, to the Vice President and said, may I ask you a question, sir? He said, well, yes, go ahead, of course. And so I said, look, since I came here 10 days ago and talked to all these people, everybody told me that things are not right in this country because there is no political will. Now, I think I'm speaking to the people here who, uh, who if anything, have political power in this country. So what, what would you tell me about what I just said about this message that I've received about no political will? So he stared me very fixedly, and then he said, you know, rapporteur, they are right. No political will. So I got my papers together and said, this meeting is over. Thank you for your attention. I'd better get out of the country as soon as possible. <laughs> and, and, th and that's what happened. But these things occurred, like a meeting also at the end of a mission with the then president of Ecuador. It was a tete-a-tete, a, -tete, a personal meeting between uh, him and I. And I told him what I had seen about the uprisings of the Ecuadorian Indians, the, the land issues, the poverty issue, uh, the privatization of, of resources in favor of the big companies and so forth. He said, you know, I know all of that. I, I know about that, but thank you for telling it to me. Once again, he said, I've been trying to do things, but I have not been able to do anything in this country, the president. And he says, you know, in this country, the state is finished. <laughs> the president of the country saying the state is finished. In other words, using a political science argument about failed states. Have you heard about that? Everybody has heard about failed states. So the president of the country actually saying, you know, delivering his country saying, this is a failed state as far as I'm concerned. Since then, there have been several more presidents of Ecuador, and I haven't been back, so I don't know what the position is right now. But I have been back to many other countries in terms of indigenous rights. And to the question of has anything changed, I would say, well, not much. In some countries, yes, indeed, there have been some activities which are useful. For example, when I went to Canada, one of the major issues raised by the Canadian organizations was uh, the legacy of the residential schools in Canada. You may have heard about that where indigenous children who were taken forcibly from their families uh, were sent to these schools uh, to become uh, real Canadians and forget about being indigenous people. There's one public official in, in Canada once mentioned, the purpose of these schools was to kill the Indian in the child. In other words, to impose another kind of culture, to destroy the culture, and so on and so forth. Well, a couple of years after, I had recommended to the UN and to the Canadian government to deal with the issue of the legacy of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, residential schools. The government of Canada did establish a compensation fund of many millions of dollars for <coughs> the survivors and created a Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission, which is at work at the present time, on looking into the details of the abuses. And then Prime Minister Harper uh, did make an apology, formal apology, uh, for the crimes committed by the government of Canada against its indigenous peoples at the time. I'm not saying that I had anything to do with it. I mean, this was something that indigenous peoples have been struggling for for years, and many Canadians have been supporting them. But the fact that this was reported in uh, uh, to the United Nations in a report uh, by uh, the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples, I think struck a chord because at the next meeting, the Canadian diplomatic representative came up to me and said, you know, your report was very important to change the minds of some of the people in government <coughs> who were resisting the, the, uh, this uh, uh, situation of, the, of uh, acknowledging the crimes of the, uh, of the residential school system. And I could give you a number of other examples, like the time when, uh, according to my children, I saved Christmas. Did I tell you about the time I saved Christmas? It was a, they were going to cull the reindeer herds in the north, uh, the government, and I was asked to write a, 
uh, a letter to the Parliament of Finland uh, saying why this would be considered a violation of the human rights of the Sami people, of the reindeer people. And uh, this letter apparently also changed the minds of some of the uh, members of parliament who were about to approve this law which would have extinguished 300,000 reindeer. You know, they would have been culled because of uh, so-called overpopulation. But they finally didn't do that. And then the reindeer herders and the Sami people uh, have uh, written me and uh, expressed to me their, their satisfaction that this letter made a difference uh, in, in their situation. So when people ask me, uh, well, what use is this report? What do you do? Well, <clears throat> it may not change the world, certainly not, but it may make a little difference, particularly if these reports are used as they are at the present time very often, by indigenous peoples as lobbying instruments, as supporting for their own work. When they say, here is the report of the special rapporteur, and they print it out and distribute it, and it appears on online and so forth, and they use it when they go to court, and they use it when they, uh, when they deal with the government, and they use it when they want to negotiate. So you get the feeling that not everything uh, in those seven years was really a waste of time. But within the UN system, there is no follow-up, and the UN doesn't have a mechanism of putting teeth in its recommendations. If it doesn't on, on you know, keeping the peace in the world, well, much less in uh, forcing or obliging uh, states to uh, comply with and implement their, their own human rights legislation or international human rights legislation. So the end result is that there is a gray area. There are things that are very satisfying in the activity of a special rapporteur. There are things that are very frustrating in the special rapporteur, but actually I have no regrets. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I've, I think we're running behind time. I'm sorry about that. I, Somebody should have put up a little piece of paper saying five minutes more, two minutes more. <laughs> you run over time. As they do in the UN, the red light begins to flash the moment you, you speak one second more than that which has been scheduled to. The red lights flash and some people go on speaking anyway, but. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Brittany. Yeah, speak louder. I don't think they can hear. Because then your, your question will be picked up by the camera if you stand up. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the future. You, you have to be on record, just as I am. <laughs> Well, that's one, one of the instances, you know, where things do happen despite of all the appearances to the contrary. Because there happen to be one or two people at that time in the right place who have the capability or the power, the small power to, to make a decision that nobody else is interested in. So in this case, it was a, a small group of liberal, progressive people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know who were friends with the people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, who were friends of mine from older days. And so they said, hey, we got to do something for the Indi indigenous peoples. Let's get this mandate going. And they managed to do it because other groups in the UN weren't interested. And that's very important. There was an opening. There was a space. And then the next thing is, well, who shall we name? Well, they both knew me from earlier days, these two diplomats, and they said, well, Rodolfo is pretty well known in this field. He's known in Latin America. 
and so forth, so we can get support for him. And once we have the Latin American group behind him, you know, then we'll go and work with the other groups. And that's exactly what they did, and it took many months, or even more than a year, because first it was the mandate, and then it was the appointment of the, of the rapporteur. But I was out of it, I wasn't part of it, you know. It's, it wasn't like putting my candidacy up for president of the republic or anything like that. It was simply, you know, being available. When I was finally asked, are you available? I said, yes, I'm available. And so that's why I'm here. <laughs> to the organization they created, yes. The World Council of Indigenous Peoples, yes. which was established on paper, but which has since disappeared, as being the entry point to contact with the UN. I mean, this is the footwork and the groundwork that had to be laid out. And this is actually my question, because yeah. over the three talks we've talked about these issues that you've mapped out today, and we've also talked about indigenous social movements. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if there's any exercise, um, I wondered about your reflections in general on um, the militarization of indigenous people, how that stands for you on a priority of issues. Um, well, those are vast issues, and I'm afraid right, right, right. Uh, we don't have the time to go into that. But uh, let me just say a couple of words. Yes, of course, any kind of event of the magnitude that this has taken on in the last few decades of and being part of the international discourse and particularly the human rights discourse uh, has its roots uh, further back and there's always a beginning but as the historians here will know better than I do uh, when do you say that something has a beginning really in social terms and, and social processes and historical change uh, so we can always go a little bit further back, but I did mention George Manuel and his efforts way back in the 70s to get a, uh, you know, some contact through the Canadian government with other governments and with other indigenous organizations, which were mostly local. They were hardly any regional organizations at all. And, uh, but this, you know, one thing leads to another and uh, it all plays its role, and the, the way isn't straight ahead, it's zigzag very often, and sometimes, you know, one step forward, two steps backward, that sort of thing, and, and everybody builds on everybody else, just like the special rapporteur builds on the commissions and the earlier rapporteur, and, and, and uh, when I mentioned uh, social movements, I speak not only about the international presence of indigenous peoples at the UN, at the ILO, Nowadays, in all of the major world conferences on any of the issues that the UN deals with, or even the European community, or the inter-American system, you, there's not one conference where there is re not a reference to the needs and rights of indigenous peoples and participation of indigenous peoples, or when that is not exactly possible or doesn't work out, if there is not a, a number of previous meetings of committees, commissions, symposia, workplace, uh, workshops where indigenous peoples are able to come and set out their, uh, their agenda, which is then taken up by others and goes into the major conference and becomes part of the official discourse. I think the construction of a new narrative uh, and a new kind of language nowadays at the, in, at the international level is due to this progress, progressive progression and progressive development of indigenous movements. Now these movements at the beginning and even now uh, 
are mainly national in content and nationally centered. Just you can, uh, for example, uh, talk about the Ecuadorian movement, you know, and its various stages of leading all the way up to participation in one of the governments of the post government to the one that I had to deal with. Uh, but now that, that one is gone as well, and the indigenous movement in Ecuador is not in its best moment. Or Bolivia, where you have an indigenous president uh, due to a long history of nationally, locally centered activity. Or the one in Mexico, the Zapatistas in southeast Chiapas with their uprising in 1994. A local group which has received worldwide attention through the media, basically, but is centered on Mexico. And the Zapatistas are very often when they receive uh, invitations to attend, for example, the World Social Forum or some other counter-systemic movements that abound nowadays in the world, they don't know. They, they don't feel comfortable with international involvement. They leave that to other organizations because they stand on their own particular regional basis. And this happens all, in all parts of the world. But suddenly, through their progressive involvement in international affairs, particularly through the uh, discussion and through the language of international human rights, these representatives of indigenous movements meet at the ILO, meet at the UN, uh, meet in Geneva, meet in Paris, meet at the World Bank, meet in Washington at the OAS and the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, and they find out, you know, that they deal with similar issues. And they find out that by joining and by coalescing and doing things together, maybe they can move forward uh, better than if they all do it on their own. And this has been a discovery uh, of the last 20 years. And you can see it at work. You certainly saw it. I witnessed it for many years, uh, coalescing around the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where you had people from, from Australia to Greenlanders to Amazon jungle dwellers to South African Bushmen, uh, Maori from New Zealand, Aborigines from Australia, of course, the First Nations in Canada, the American Indians of the plains of the Northwest, of the Southwest, and so forth, coming together on this one issue that brought them all together, which is struggling in the UN to get the adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which they achieved back in the year 2007. But now, of course, this is now the ne next stage. What do we do with that UN Declaration? Will it work? Will it not work? What use is another declaration in the UN system? You know, when I see the papers here in the States or something, uh, or, or see some TV programs, I, I, as I sometimes get the feeling that for many people in this country, the UN is some sort of bad joke, you know? It really isn't good for anything, it costs us a lot of money, and it always votes against the US anyway. So why should we be concerned here? Well, that's not the way that the indigenous peoples see the UN. The indigenous people that I have encountered over these years from the US, from Canada, and some of the countries, mainly Western European, that are enormously supportive of their work and have been for many years, many decades, you know, they really see that working in the UN, working through the UN, uh, can be a big step forward for them. It's a boon to their struggles all over. So um, despite some government or public, you know, journalist opinion about the uselessness of the UN, uh, for some people and some groups, it has been the only way to get world attention. Okay? Sorry, I took no. longer than expected. Hmm? I would like to thank Professor Stavenhagen for this evening's talk. Thank you. Thank you. I also down. thank Sarah Patton Moberg for her fabulous work organizing all of the logistics for this series, Professor Stavenhagen's visit, uh, and uh, the reception we're going to have outside, to which I'd like to invite you. And lastly, to thank Anne and Richard Posen, the donors whose generosity has made possible Professor Stavenhagen's stay here, uh, Justice L.B. Sachs, last year and next year. Stay tuned. <laughs>
Um, historian Liz Borgwart from Washington University will be our cousin visiting professor. And the spirits of the heating system have managed to uh, <laughs> hold off until this last moment. People who attended uh, Justice Sachs' lectures last year remember we had a lot more problems with them. So because they've been kind to you. And thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> A pleasure. <laughs>